Hello everyone and welcome to this ADI UK event in which we'll be celebrating what we've achieved during our three-year pilot but also telling you about some of the great work that we'll be taking forward in our long-term investment phase. I'm Emma Gordon, Director of the Programme and you'll be hearing more from me in a moment but without further ado I would like to welcome Hetan Shah, Chief um, executive of the British Academy, who's going to be giving our keynote speech today on the COVID decade, a pandemic with a long shadow and what this might mean for data. Heaton. Thanks very much, Emma. Uh, I was asked just to kick off the conference with a few uh, reflections based on uh, a report that we at the British Academy recently did uh, at the request of Sir Patrick Valance, uh, looking at the long-term societal effects uh, of the pandemic. So I just wanted to give uh, sort of eight or nine reflections that come from that. The first thing to say is that the Academy report, uh, uh, which is called the COVID decade, uh, argues that, you know, that, that the pandemic will cast a very long shadow uh, uh, economically, socially, and culturally. We talk about a COVID decade uh, where we'll be seeing uh, all of the uh, the effects play out. Uh, and of course, if you look over the last year, there's been a lot of data innovation in the way that we've been using data, but unsurprisingly, a lot of that has been focused on health. Uh, and I suppose our report implies that uh, looking ahead, it will be critical for us to uh, think about the social and economic consequences uh, and link some of that to the health data. Second reflection is that uh, our report uh, really uh, argues that during this pandemic period, policymakers have talked to experts and researchers in a different way uh, and have also shared data uh, in a different way. So I think it's an important question about how can we retain some of that uh, way of working, uh, that sort of porousness into the future, as it were. How can we better connect policymakers, researchers and data owners into the future so that this doesn't just happen during a kind of emergency setting? Third reflection uh, is that our work showed the importance of multi-level governance during the, the pandemic. Uh, so, for example, if you look at uh, the, the, the track and trace, uh, test and trace system, uh, it was only after we started getting local authorities involved that uh, it started really working well, whereas a highly centralised approach uh, at the, the outset didn't, didn't work so well. But there's also something about multi-level data uh, as, well, as well as multi-level governance. So how do we link uh, local and central data more effectively, but also, and I think this is a conversation that has happened less well, uh, regional to regional data as well. So uh, all of this is, of course, tied up with much wider issues uh, of governance in the UK. We have very centralised uh, government system, as you all know. But g given the government's levelling up agenda, uh, which in some ways is still a slogan rather than a policy, it's not always clear what, what is trying to be levelled up. Uh, there, it seems to me in that vagueness there's an opportunity to actually say, uh, should levelling up be about data as much about as about other things? You know, how, do, how would we level up uh, data? A fourth reflection is, has public uh, risk appetite on data changed as a result of the pandemic? Or, uh, this is a kind of footnote question, did we have it wrong all along? Uh, so obviously the pandemic has shown lots of data use at very high speed uh, for the public interest and very much in the public eye. Uh, and um, it, it's too early to tell, I think, uh, in terms of public attitudes, but it did strike me, uh, I saw uh, YouGov polling results saying that 61% of the public supported vaccine passports uh, if it allowed venues to lift social distancing. Now, uh, we've seen, of course, in uh, over many years, not gone without commentary from our community, how quickly uh, people, including ourselves, have been to hand over data about ourselves to entities like Google and Amazon. Uh, all of this kind of points to the fact that we need to make the benefits tangible. Uh, and if those benefits are tangible, people are willing to give data for, uh, you know, for benefit, as it were. But we've just come out of this period where that's been very, very clear. So how do we build upon that? How do we make the case uh, for better data access and linkage uh, uh, off the back of the pandemic? I mean, thinking very ambitiously, is there an opportunity to make the case for digital identifiers as there are in Scandinavia? 
Uh, I think, you know, we've always shied away from that kind of conversation, but perhaps this is an opportunity to start that. It does leave, however, uh, a, a question which is, who will make such a case? Uh, and it's still not clear to me, despite there being a relatively crowded landscape of organisations interested in data, who are the advocacy organisations for data usage, which I think is a conversation that we need to have collectively. Uh, and one final bit on this point is that uh, some of you may be aware the Department for Health and Social Care has recently set up a COVID patient advisory group uh, to deliberate on data sharing, privacy uh, and equity. Uh, and I'm on the independent advisory group for that. And I think it'll be very interesting. This will be the first straw in the wind, I think, as to where the public uh, uh, views have shifted as a result of the pandemic uh, around data use. My fifth reflection is um, about ADR UK itself, which um, you know we're celebrating three years uh, here today, uh, and it's obviously made great progress. Uh, I think, in particular, if you look at justice and the data first work, or with uh, HMRC, uh, but it's also noteworthy. Even things that perhaps some of us thought might be quick wins, such as Leo data, have really taken a lot of time to unlock. Uh, so it's going to be key, I think, looking ahead, that uh, as well as unlocking more data and pushing for that, we need to make sure we make the most of the data that we already have uh, in order to show uh, the value that we can uh, all derive uh, for, from the investments that have already been made. Sixth reflection is that, in a sense, a holy grail beyond getting data out of government, which is obviously what ADR UK focuses on, is how we link some of uh, this administrative data to longitudinal studies. Uh, and this is uh, work that's going on. Uh, ESRC, uh, MRC and Wellcome have come together uh, and are setting up uh, and exploring an initiative called Population Research UK, uh, whose partnership group uh, I chair. Uh, and this is exploring the opportunity for linking uh, longitudinal data uh, and cohort studies to uh, administrative and other forms of data. And I encourage all of you to really input into this, uh, that, you know, that the, the kind of models for what might work are currently being explored. Uh, and I think, you know, this is, it's a complex uh, and uneven landscape in that space. So your visions and uh, uh, reflections on what are the strategies by which we could kind of make that work uh, would I think be really helpful. And then the kind of final reflection before I wrap up is, it does just feel to me that there is an opportunity within government around this agenda right now. Uh, of course, this always shifts and some parts of government care more than others, but it seems to me there are real uh, areas of interest uh, within government around the data agenda. And I think the pandemic has brought all of that to the fore. Uh, I mean, the fact that the prime minister talked about data, not dates, and I think he really meant that and understood that. Uh, it, that does suggest a kind of powerful uh, opportunity for us. Uh, and I've been working, for example, with the number 10 data science unit, which again uh, is working in the heart of government trying to use data in different and interesting ways. So there is an opportunity there, which I think we should continue to push our ambitious agenda. Uh, you know, if not now, then when? So let me conclude. Uh, our, our British Academy report, the COVID decade, just shows, I think, the far-reaching social, economic and cultural impacts of the pandemic on society, that uh, inequalities have been exposed, exacerbated and solidified. Uh, and so it will take a kind of redoubling of our efforts uh, as a community to access and link the data to make sense uh, of the implications uh, of the pandemic on society. And all of the work that you do matters uh, because it can help cast light on a fast changing society you know, how a city centre is going to shift, how a working pattern is going to shift, all of this needs to be understood. Uh, it can help shape society because policymakers are uh, really looking at where we need to go next as a result of the changes that we're facing. But I think um, most importantly of all, it can serve the most marginalised who've suffered the most but lack uh, a voice. And so, you know, that the work that you do, I think, is really powerful. So let me just say, you know, there's been much talk of the heroes of the pandemic, but the data community, I think, in this sense, has been overlooked. Uh, that the kind of patient work that you all do and the painstaking work that you do has been important and, let me say, heroic. 
so you know stay motivated and energized sometimes it's difficult to do that but uh, the work that you do is making a considerable difference and let's not give up on pressing for change uh, I'm optimistic that things could move positively that there are opportunities both in terms of the the public appetite uh, and also the policy environment uh, but uh, press on uh, and so let me wish you all a good conference and I'll stop there thank you it was really the insightful introduction to our conference and uh, we'll be picking up on some of those uh, themes that you brought up uh, as we go through to the panel session at the end of uh, session one uh, this afternoon so thanks very much for that I know you can't stay for that because you've got other things to be doing but we will be touching on those points that you've raised um, so if I could have the next slide please um, I'm just going to start by giving a brief introduction to ADI UK and just to let you know you can submit questions for the Q&A session at the end that's at the end of each of the three sessions this afternoon and you do that by clicking on the speech bubble icon to the left hand side of the screen we'll get those questions through. Um, so we're a partnership of academic groups that led by my team within ESRC, working to create linked research data sets from administrative sources and making these available to researchers through our network of trusted research environments. And you'll be hearing from a range of our partners this afternoon, starting with the lead academics in ADR Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, as well as one of the researchers commissioned from our ADR England portfolio. And session two will be focusing on the contribution of our government partners in the context of the management of the pandemic. And session three will be focusing on an issue that is very close to my heart, which is how we ensure that everything we do is truly in the public good. Can I have the next slide, please? So this slide is a very high level overview of how we work with data owners to create new linked data sets for research. Across the partnership, our teams lead on these negotiations, always basing the creation of new data sets on an identified need for policy relevant research. Data are then linked and de-identified before being made accessible to researchers. We then commission research based on these data sets to support collaborative engagement between policy departments and researchers, reinforcing the feedback loop between those who have collaborated with us to open up access to data and the researchers commissioned to analyze it. Next slide, please. So this slide is just there to give you a sense of the scale of the amount of research that we are facilitating across our, um, the UK. Now, partners in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have core funding to open up access to data and carry out research. And their engagement with data owning organisations isn't captured here since much of that has been developing over many decades. But part of, uh, as part of the pilot investment that's been running since 2018, uh, my team and ONS in particular have worked with a range of government departments to open up access to new data and we're in discussions with many more organizations and we're also funding ever more research to make use of this data and in addition to the work that we'd planned to deliver back in 2018 the ADI UK program also strategically positioned our partners to support the management of the COVID-19 pandemic through our investments both in data infrastructure and people and as we move out of the critical phase into the recovery phase of the pandemic, as Hetton mentioned, ADI UK will be placing an increasingly pivotal role as a need for insights based on health data linked to education, benefits, income, homelessness, crime and justice data grows. And I hope that by the end of the afternoon, you'll be convinced that we are well placed to meet this agenda. Next slide, please. And here's just a snapshot of the types of data linkage projects that we have funded to date. And you'll be hearing about some of these in more detail in the afternoon. But just to give you a quick summary, uh, the UK-wide ADARC project is being led by ADR Wales. And this was set up to understand more about the impact of agricultural and environmental policy changes on people working in the farming sector. At present, much of the data used to develop policy in this area relates to farm business activities and impacts that farming has on the environment. And less is known about the people who work in this sector, meaning the dots between the farm holdings, the businesses, farmers and farm households are rarely joined. 
And this project will address this evidence gap by linking a variety of existing data sets, making these accessible through our trusted research environment network. Um, Hetta mentioned the Data First project. This is being led by the Ministry of Justice to unlock the potential of MOJ's wealth of data by uh, linking administrative data sets from across the justice system. And this includes family, civil and criminal courts data. And by linking these data sets, we can build a picture of the characteristics of justice system users and how they interact over time with the civil, family and criminal courts. And understanding these characteristics, the patterns of frequent use and common transitions between services will develop our understanding of what works and inform the development of policies and services. If I move on to the wage and employment dynamics project, this is linking annual survey of hours of earnings data to 2011 census and HMRC data to explore trends in wages and employment in Britain, including how pay progresses in different groups in society and how wage inequality occurs. And key questions it will help answer include how people's earnings progress through their career, how does this differ depending on the characteristics such as gender, disability or, or ethnicity, and how, who does, does and does not progress out of low pay employment. And according to a re report published by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, 58% of people living in relative po poverty in the UK today are in a working household. And with coronavirus lockdown likely to worsen these figures further, research is needed to address these issues now more than ever. The eChild study is linking hospital, school and social care records held by the NHS and Department for Education to create the identified research-ready data set that will be made accessible through the ONS Secure Research Service. And the eChild data set contains health, education and social care data for all children born on or after the 1st of September 1995. So this is around 14 million children and young people. And research using eChild will help government and the providers of children's services to better understand their needs and to see which groups might be falling through the gaps. Again, as a result of COVID, this data set is now more important than ever. Next slide, please. I mentioned at the start that we've been running as a pilot investment since 2018. From the 1st of April this year, we officially moved into our long-term investment phase in which we'll be uh, taking forward an even more ambitious programme of work. I'm also officially announcing the launch of ADR England today. I'll say more about this on the next slide, but just to say that key elements of our more ambitious work plan moving forward include an even greater focus on public engagement to ensure that we maintain the social contract to use administrative data for research. And we'll also be doing more to train people in how to use the new linked data sets so researchers across a wide range of disciplines can make use of these in their research. Next slide, please. So moving on to ADR England, this is filling a gap that was in our pilot investment structure while we tested what works in our engagement with Whitehall departments. And this slide gives you a snapshot of all the data owning organisations we've been working with to date and all of the research institutions who have been funded to deliver both new data linkages and research. And these now all sit within our ADR England portfolio. And today I'm also announcing the launch of a call to support the creation of new research ready data sets, building on everything that we've learned during our pilot phase. And organizations funded through this call will then also join ADR England. And the details of what is in scope and what isn't are all on our website. So if you're interested in submitting an expression of interest to us, please do check this out and get in touch. Next slide, please. And finally, there are a couple more ways you can get involved. Our website has the details on the front page for you to sign up to receive our newsletter, which includes details of funding opportunities as well as new data sets and research that have come out. And you can also sign up to becoming an ADI UK ambassador, which involves advocating for our work within your own organisation and peer networks. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. That's my introduction. Uh, over now. So Dr. Alex Sutherland, who is the Chief Scientist from the Behavioural Insights team, 
who's going to be discussing some of the work that we commissioned him and his team to do around understanding what the remaining barriers were to data and linkage, but also about the potential for using this data for public good. Alex, over to Great. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. I'm just going to make sure I can move my slides on remotely. I'm being brave. I don't get to say those immortal lines. Next slide, please. Um, so Emma's introduced me, so I'll skip straight to the, the meat of what I'm going to talk about. Um, BIT were commissioned uh, to work on a project to understand barriers to data sharing in government and to help unpack that a bit more for ADR UK. Um, it's really relevant, especially with the new evaluation task force getting going, and so much of that will depend on data. I'm going to summarise that work very quickly, um, then talk about some follow-on work we've done, and then hopefully show you some results from another strand of work that has dependent, depended on uh, actually getting some data linked together. So this is uh, the report uh, you can find on the ADRU web, ADR UK website, so applying behavioural insights across government data sharing. So, so you know, fairly lengthy report, I'll try and summarise very quickly. Um, what makes data sharing hard? Um, the first thing, it's complex. It can take a long time. It has many hurdles, barriers, frictions. It requires judgment under uncertainty, particularly around risk. And it, requ and it requires uh, focus and resources and, and planning, least of all. Um, and these are all things that create uncertainty and drag on linkage projects. And data doesn't just fall out of the sky. To access it requires effort, time and money. It's also worth noting the very existence of ADI UK um, and the infrastructure around data access means that funders need to acknowledge that the data access is really a non-trivial part of conducting research and it needs to be recognised as a valuable endeavour it is. And I think ADI UK are the crystallisation of that. Um, so to unpack a bit more uh, what I mean by data sharing and behavioural barriers, um, I'll very quickly talk through a couple of things, so more detail in the report, but some specifics regarding barriers and risk. So um, some of this comes across as very mundane project management, but that's the stuff that really matters. So stakeholder management and project management and understanding uh, the resource barriers to why a particular data set cannot be shared is really important. That requires engagement with um, government partners or data owners. And there are also a great deal, as many of you will be familiar with, legal risks and uncertainty around data sharing that can uh, kind of chill the enthusiasm for sharing. Um, and the rewards as well, finally, um, may not accrue to those who need to contribute or may not be realised on short enough timescales for a given department. And you have kind of counters for that, like uh, the, the Shared Outcomes Fund that are that running at the moment, which is encouraging data sharing across government. But to try um, uh, and, and make kind of these things stick a bit more and summarise the problems a bit further, um, I, I've kind of created my little acronym very quickly. So um, th these are the things that I think were most salient to me uh, when we work on this project. So legislation, there's a lot of legislation used in relation to data sharing, um, and particularly when done by government. And really one of the challenges and the, one of the things we recommended is trying to make sure that government departments understand new legislation and don't rely on older legislation, which could be driven by uh, a status quo bias. Legislation itself might come across as a barrier, but it's more likely the interpretation and implementation that's a problem. And this is particularly around things like risk aversion and the salience of GDPR and the ICO, and in particular, fines. Um, but getting agreement across departments and, and, and having drivers like the Treasury out, the Outcomes Fund, I've met, Shared Outcomes Fund I mentioned, um, really help um, with this as well. Um, and then after kind of moving on to the, the, the three Ps, uh, as I've put on here, Process, paperwork, people, or oh, four piece, rather, and the public. So process, really, there needs to be a process for data sharing to happen. You need to make sure there is one in place if there isn't one. The paperwork, um, I advocate for what we call minimally violent paperwork, and that has to include users in development and a clear process of feeding back to improve. My, my days of accepting kind of poor quality paperwork, I think, are long, are long over. People, none of this really happens by magic yet, and we all have our frailties at the end. There's, there's a really big uh, need to put ourselves as externals in the shoes of those in government uh, working to uh, under often under immense pressure. Um, it isn't, um, it's more about trying to understand the other person's position. I think that can also help with early negotiations and access. The public, um, as Hetan mentioned, a kind of public acceptability of sharing uh, moves on probably more quickly than, than um, in government and elsewhere. Um, and I think that is. You know, there's a great ADR UK report on this that was published last year on public attitudes to data sharing, which I'll, I'll mention briefly in a moment. 
The final uh, bit of this really is, and the, perhaps the hardest part, is about kind of a, a customer service attitude and data, data in the service of public good. These are things that um, are really matter in overall, and it also requires maybe a change of mindset when it, for data owners, making sure that actually uh, they, they think about how to uh, share data. So moving on, this is the ADI UK report. Basically, people are very uh, are okay, we're comfortable with data sharing. Um, if it's in the public interest, if there's adequate privacy and security, and there's trust and transparency. So I think worth uh, reiterating those points. So what else can we do? So I've mentioned a few kind of the issues, what the barriers, what can we do? Um, as I mentioned, like changing the default mindset is perhaps one of the things that we could we can consider. So thinking about how you get people to think how we can share, not why should we share. And perhaps easier said than done, but having it written down in some guidance might help. Um, highlighting in particular at the moment the security of the uh, secure research service model as uh, secure by design. For example, having a metric like how many data issues on a per hour basis of access to SOS have there been. Um, challenging assumptions behind barriers, you know, why is it this and why not that? So working from home remote access, why is that less secure than in office remote access if everyone's being remote, as an example? Um, is, there a, is there a question about increasing trust amongst civil servants? Can we foster a sense of collaboration? It's also important to highlight the relevance and importance of data sharing and its uses. So it is a marathon, definitely sometimes on a sprint. And increasing the transparency of linkage projects and making this uh, public commitments and making progress with those commitments public as well. But we can also do things uh, to help reduce frictions and also make data more accessible, if not actually accessed. And the follow on bit of what we've been doing is looking at the exclusive uh, of, of synthetic data, which is where data can be copied with different degrees of fidelity to the original. Um, and move on very quickly from this. There are broadly very two, two broad categories. One is high fidelity, one is low fidelity. The high fidelity maintains um, the relationships, um, but doesn't relate to actual individuals within the data. Low fidelity basically gives you the structure of the data, but doesn't include the relationships within it. Um, and what we've been trying to make uh, more available uh, is the is low, low fidelity as an option for governments to share data. So as part of the work we've been doing for ADI UK, we've developed uh, some code to help make low fidelity synthetic data easier to generate, um, which we can uh, talk about afterwards if people are interested, and we'll make the code available. Um, and very quickly, I'm going to finish up by talking about uh, some results from the work we've been doing for ADI UK. Um, so this is linking completed education endowment foundation trials to other kinds of outcomes, so education outcomes. And this is uh, a result of quite a lot of work, but link, basically what we managed to do as a result of funding from ADI UK is linked to uh, completed education trials to MPD data, we managed to link 32 trials to different outcomes, to the exclusion outcomes, very preliminary results. Um, but really, I want to focus on not the results themselves, although they're very interesting, they are preliminary, it's the return on investment. So very quick, the highlight from that is for every one pound spent so far on the reanalysis work we've been doing, we've been we've saved about 380 pounds, which has let it sink in for a minute how big the saving is and how efficient it is to, uh, cost effective it is to share and link data. Um, I've rattled through those things very quickly, I'm conscious I need to move on, so I'm going to finish up and hand over. Thank you very much, um, Alex. Uh, so we'll just move into the uh, panel session now. So I'd like to welcome uh, Chris Dibbon, David Ford and Dermot O'Reilly, uh, along with Alex, uh, into this session. <coughs> and I'll, I'll just begin by um, a call myself, but, uh, welcome questions from the audience as well. So please do send them those through if you have any questions. Um, both relating to Hetton's talk and Alex's talk and what we'll uh, be discussing now. So can I start by asking the ADI UK partners on the panel um, what progress you think has been made on data linkage to support research since ADI UK started in 2018? And David, I'll start with you. Thanks, Emma. It's a good question and a pleasure to be part of this fantastic event today celebrating three years of uh, ADI UK. We've been around a little longer in Wales doing data linkage. Um, you may or may not know that, that uh, um, we use the Sales Data Bank as the underpinning infrastructure to do data linkage. And Sales has been around more than a decade. It's just approaching its 600th data sharing agreement with um, individual organisations that have been sharing data. And then we link all that data together. And so we had a flying start into um, ADI UK. Indeed, we were part of its predecessing uh, investment, the ADRN. 
Um, and what ADR UK has done for us, I think, is really put a, um, a, a tremendous accelerant under our relationship with, with Welsh Government, who are our uh, principal uh, 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 governmental body in Wales. Uh, and uh, that has been, I think, incredibly exciting to be part of. Um, we've we've managed to acquire a lot more data, and, and I can say a few words about how COVID has accelerated that. But my colleague Stephanie is going to talk about that later, so I'm not going to tread on that ground too much. But I would say that actually, what ADR has really uh, enabled us to do is to develop really close and intimate links with policymakers right across Welsh government in every um, aspect, uh, enabled through Stephanie's team in the uh, knowledge and analytical services. Um, and really align a program of research um, under strategic impact, six, seven strategic impact programs to the decision needs and evidential needs of, of, of policymakers and decision makers in government. And that has done two things. One, obviously, it's made us focus our research energies on questions that are going to have an impact potentially, which is very important. But it's also identified where data could be made available, but it isn't and has flushed out lots of important research questions. Um, that's within Wales, and as I said, there's a lot of data linkage that goes on, and many of the issues, you don't get data 600 different organisations to sign on the dotted line to share data without addressing many of those issues that Alex highlighted so thoughtfully for us. Um, but of course, it, there are enormous potential for additional data from um, UK governmental and um, organisations, ministries and departments. And, and there have been some fantastic uh, moves forward in that space as well for Wales. And, and I'll, I'll highlight just one, but of many, um, and that would be the Data First project, which in addition to do a fantastic job of, of curating their own data, linking it together, making it research ready, all supported by, by ADI UK, are also, in addition to providing that to the SRS to allow researcher access, they're, we're also, um, uh, they're also providing that to the Sale Data Bank so that we can link it into our archives with all that other data as well and, and support a really interesting program of re uh, linked data research on the back of it. So it's, that's really exciting. Uh, and lots of work with ONS um, uh, linking uh, uh, their census and many other their data assets back into Wales for the Welsh population as well. Thanks very much, David. That was uh, a, a really good start to the conversation. Uh, Chris, shall I go over to you next? Great. Same question. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, so it was a, 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 it's a tricky question, isn't it? Um, because there's obviously a, a lot of work going on. Um, but perhaps um, I could highlight one area that I think has been really helpful. And in some ways, it seems a bit odd uh, to focus on this. Um, but uh, because uh, the, uh, the data linkage I, I just wanted to highlight is the linkage of the census, the national censuses to administrative data. I, I said it feels a little bit odd because that's, of course, a data set that's existed for a long time. Um, and there's been access to it in various forms. But what's really exciting is now the ability to link it to the administrative data that are starting to become available uh, across the, the UK. Um, uh, I think this is exciting because administrative data, um, though very powerful, um, is somewhat limited in terms of understanding the context uh, of somebody's life or the process you're interested in. So it's very good at uh, identifying when and where different events to an individual's happened, whether a hospital episode or an educational uh, event. But it's less less um, helpful when you want to try and understand how these kind of events happen. So to particularly what type of people, but where are those people living? So what kind of household are they living in? What kind of care and support they have? Um, and this is where the census linked to this data becomes very useful. And I think just to follow up what David said, I think this has been particularly possible because this new phase of funded has uh, enabled us to work very closely with governmental partners um, and obviously the agencies that uh, produce uh, the census. But perhaps if I could just highlight a, a few of the sort of key things that I think this census uh, will allow us to do. So I mentioned before 
understanding the person themselves. So on the whole, imaginative data often doesn't collect important characteristics of uh, people very well. For example, their ethnicity or whether they have a disability or not, their religion. Um, and of course, that these are uh, important um, parts of the population to understand, particularly around issues of e equity um, and difference in, in outcomes, these protected characteristics. So the, the second thing uh, is then understanding how people live. Obviously, we don't live uh, as individuals, but live in households. Uh, and so the ability to understand how uh, different uh, individuals that we might identify in the administrative data are, of course, uh, co-living. And this is particularly useful around things like who might care for somebody, so levels of care. It's important understanding educational outcomes, understanding the kind of transfers of uh, human capital between generations uh, in households. So uh, really perhaps the census is our best way of understanding how people live together in these very important micro units. Uh, the third aspect that I think the census is really useful is understanding uh, work um, and particularly our occupations. Um, obviously, we can have information uh, from other sources like HMRC on DWP on uh, whether someone's employed or not. But perhaps still the best way of understanding what occupation somebody is in is from the census. And then important other issues around that for, uh, and this is obviously been very important during this uh, COVID period, but where people work, what kind of work context uh, and location they are, how do they travel to work? Uh, so uh, uh, outside the COVID period, then obviously the issues around healthy um, uh, commuting and um, active travel, so uh, an aspect of uh, health. Uh, so three really important characteristics then that uh, I think this uh, greater um, ability to link to the census um, and of course you know, the census being by definition covering the whole population. So uh, enormously uh, powerful in the sense to which uh, we can have large uh, samples in a sense of the population. Um, uh, and this is particularly important for looking for, um, to understand what's happening within smaller groups within the population. So Emma, linking to the census has been a real highlight for me. Thanks very much, Chris. And, and uh, Dermot, any reflections from Thanks, Northern Emma. Ireland? Um... Yes, uh, f um, I took a slightly different tack from the other two speakers, my esteemed colleagues, in that while a lot of the conversation has been about data linkage and data, which of course is king, for me, the last three years have brought about a change in people. And I think the core of ADR is actually about connecting people. And then you connect the data and bring the linked data on online. And for me, the big change has been about how we've been able to bring the right people together in a system that works. And I must acknowledge credit to my team, Francis and Elizabeth, who've been central to this, who we now have a system in Northern Ireland whereby we can bring all of the key stakeholders together around the table at the outset of projects. This is the uh, academics, the uh, data owners, the policy makers, and all of the key voluntary and uh, people with user experience, lived experience, uh, around a table and drive a project forward all the way from inception through to dissemination. And that's been very powerful. And over the last three years, we've noticed that things have changed. And the change has been that instead of us knocking on the door, asking people, can we get access to your data? Can we answer some questions for you? People are now coming to us and saying, please, can you help us sort some of our policy related questions out? And that's been quite transformational. And that includes, you know, organizations like the Police Service in Northern Ireland, prisoners, farming, environment, education, local authorities, and so on and so on. And of course, health, who are always very helpful with, to whatever help you can give them. Second thing, point I'd make is that uh, the ADR has been a conduit for connecting researchers across the UK. And increasingly now we're realizing that in my wee neck of the woods in Northern Ireland, we share the same policy concerns that the, that the guys in Wales and Scotland and England have as well, and that our research agendas actually overlap to a fair extent. And increasingly now, we are linking the research communities together, sharing problems with our data, bringing uh, opportunities to explore uh, how we can approach the research agendas, but also to use those shared uh, 
data, well, not share data yet, but they, they shared policy agendas to tease out how devolution and the differences in policies can be explored to understand uh, what might work and what doesn't work to, to uh, such a great extent in different jurisdictions as well. So I'll just finish by saying that, yes, we've been very strong links now with the, within the devolved administration, and we look forward to working with the researchers in the new uh, member of the family in England. Thanks very much, Dermot. It really takes me nicely on to my next question, which was thinking about what has been achieved in our engagement with Whitehall Department since we started. Where do you see the potential impact for the programme over the next five years? And if I go to Alex first with this question. Thanks, Emma. I'll be very brief. I mean, as I've mentioned um, during my presentation, there are so many things changing now uh, about how government operates. Um, that I think that there's no question really that data is the key to a lot of a lot of what the government is trying to do. Um, I think, as I mentioned in particular, that the the idea of building evaluation into kind of the DNA of what government government is doing is the crucial role that data will play in that. Um, and ADI UK have been, I think, central in pushing part of that, that agenda across as well. Um, I think there's also just a very basic understanding. Uh, about you know who is accessing a service, who who is the beneficiary or not of a particular policy, um, these kinds of things, these kinds of questions uh, uh, can be answered, asked and answered much more easily with um, with data linked together. And I think the the real the real accelerator for me in the next few years um, is going to be working across governmental policy areas. So as I mentioned, the shared outcomes fund is kind of an internal driver for government to do this. Um, but I think actually having data available in the SRS and then more generally in the different uh, administrations will, will allow us to ask and answer much more um, detailed questions about very basic things like who's accessing services that we wouldn't otherwise have done. Now, there's an, an example of a piece of work that I was working on a few years ago with my former colleagues at RAND, um, the, the Offender Liaison Diversion Programme, which required us to link together, I think, five or six different data sets um, it took an inordinate amount of negotiation to do that and some, you know, uh, some very patient people, my colleagues, uh, and on the other side as well. Um, but that sort of project, we should, you know, we should understand the population who's accessing that uh, program much more easily than it took for that project. And I think that we have that opportunity coming towards us now um, with uh, ADI UK's work and indeed the wider kind of use of data in government. Thanks very much, uh, Alex. Uh, Chris, I'll go to you next. Uh, any reflections on, on what we should be focusing on next, what the big um, ticket yeah, items so, are? Thanks, Emma. So uh, just reflecting on this, I, I, I think um, in the past, we've had a bit of a, a catch-22 problem where uh, we've often been going to uh, data custodians uh, and trying to um, make a uh, starting a conversation about the utility of their data both to themselves and to understand important processes across the country um, and that, that's always slightly difficult in the absence of examples and of course this is where the catch-22 that uh, when this data is not available it's difficult to point to examples um, and I think that, that that situation is changing now um, because uh, because of the, uh, the the data that's starting to be am uh, amassed and held. Uh, so I think that both the challenge for us then will be to really produce these high utility examples. And I think, uh, of course, you know, COVID-19 has helped in this to really help uh, produce examples of where data has helped very directly into policy making and uh, rapid decision making. So I, I think our challenge here is to, um, in an ongoing process, uh, D deliver useful, impactful examples of how the data, and then integrate that then into a, the, the debate about uh, why it's uh, you know really uh, of great importance for uh, data controllers, data custodians to um, to work with us to make this data more readily available. Yeah, absolutely, very good points there, um, David. Any reflection from you? You, you touched on on the uh, data that will be coming into the sale data bank from MOJ. What else do you want to see flowing in your well, direction? Well, I, the the we have a particular interest in where in Wales, as I suppose everybody does when you think about it, in young people, uh, and uh, as they're the future, everybody's future, uh, and. Um, uh, 
the Future Generations Act is the is the sort of uh, piece of policy uh, that that focused us on that. And as a consequence, we're really interested in trying to accumulate the best quality data that we can around families. Uh, and uh, for us, the biggest opportunity that the Data First project presents us is to uh, is to try and articulate uh, families more clearly uh, and households, so that we can understand the context in which children are are, are living and, and and hopefully thriving and intervene as and where policymakers can intervene as and where um, uh, appropriate. And so particularly if we would take that um, that uh, uh, emphasis, we would still be missing some insights into um, households and families, um, as Chris was reflecting earlier, without understanding a bit more about their economics um, and circumstances, for example, as, as we know, deprivation and other <coughs> similar economic um, issues are, are major drivers of all sorts of problems, uh, health, um, crime and all and, and so forth and so we 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 hope um with a great deal of uh, anticipation that we were to work with colleagues ons of course as an uh, intermediary but also colleagues in hmrc and dwp to start to become uh, to develop the process by which um, wales can receive some data that's pertinent from their archives that are pertinent to the research and interests of welsh government and and the academics and make that a little bit more as time goes on uh, uh, customer practice uh, rather than an exceptional thing that happens rather move towards a time when this is just um uh, what we do and and as chris said um, the way that's going to happen is by doing something very sensible with the data and really impactful with the data as and when it, it, it arrives. And that's that's critically important. So I, I think, you know, carry on really interested in the, in the world of the ju if justice and particularly family justice, but also um, uh, uh, other, other forms of uh, um, justice data. Um, but then trying to uh, amass uh, data that, that helps us understand the economic and social circumstances of people um, and households more. Um, more, more clearly. Thanks very much. Uh, we've got uh, lots of questions coming through um, from the audience now, but just before I move to those, uh, any final reflections on that question from you, Dan? Yes, quickly, thank you, Emma. The, the last year and a half have taught us what we can do with health data at speed to produce effective. Uh, answers that the population needs now. What we need to do is to translate that those lessons all the way through Whitehall. And for the last year and a half, it has been health, health, health. I think I think we now need to shift the emphasis and look at the wider impacts on society. And um, because we've got all of the economic tsunami that's going to come on the back of COVID. But remember what happened before COVID BC. Uh, in that uh, Brexit was around, and then before that, there's welfare reform. These are huge uh, policy changes that affect the society, and we need to be exploring those. And that will be quite challenging for Whitehall departments, but I think this is what a society we need. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, so the uh, first question I'll take from the audience is one uh, that I think I should probably take the first uh, step at answering. So. Um, the question is, it seems that government have their own ambitions for bringing data together from across government departments. Does this help or hinder ADI UK's work? And uh, we are very aware of a lot of the great work that government is doing around this. And Hetton mentioned, you know, there's a much bigger appetite within government to, in inverted commas, sort out data sharing and data access. And um, just to reassure everyone, the ADI UK programme is intimately involved in a lot of these uh, programmes of work. So programmes, uh, projects funded through the Treasury Strategic Outcomes Fund that include data linkage. Uh, we're partnering with them to make sure that that data can be made available to external researchers as well as those within government. But also the ONS have a very ambitious programme of work around uh, data linkage right across government as well. And again, uh, we're very intimately involved in that. And essentially that will be, uh, if you think about the data first example uh, that we've mentioned a few times, you'll be hearing more about throughout the afternoon. 
Uh, the issue for Ministry of Justice is they didn't have good access to linked data from across the criminal and justice system. Um, and because we provided the funding for them, for them to do that, they could then make that data available to external researchers. So it was a win-win. But the ONS pro uh, programme is about the first bit. It's about government having better access to data. And, and if they sort that out, then essentially the ADI UK programme is the front end to being able to um, allow better access to that data for external users. So it is all integrated and, and hopefully it will be seamless as well. Um, but if I move on to the next question, uh, Heta mentioned the success of linking local authority to central government data in the context of the pandemic. What challenges might using local level data pose versus working just with central government? And how do you think use of local level data can help research findings feed into policy delivery more effectively in general beyond immediate successes with track and trace? Um, I think I'll go to David with that question first, because I know um, SAIL works as well as working with central government. Uh, you also work with local authorities as part of ADL Wales. So over to you, David. I'm really very much in support of, of, of local data, whatever that really means. Uh, I, I think there's always going to be a degradation in data quantity and quality uh, as it moves to be aggregated in central government. And, and the most authentic, the richest, the most the most detailed data is almost always going to be held either in a hospital, in a general practice, or in a in a um, uh, in a in a local government organization or an agency. Um, so um, I think there's horses for courses. Um, I think sometimes you need aggregated standardized returns um, at a governmental level, whether that be within a devolved administration or in the UK, that, that gives you the big picture. But sometimes when you need to explore a, a circumstance, a research an area, you, you need to be able to get down to, to closer to the real data and, and perhaps finer grain data and understand things better. Um, and that means that those organizations, for, for both the reasons of, 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 of having granular data they can use for themselves, but also for, for the data that they can easily repackage and send upwards up the, up the pyramid, they they need to be supported and they need to be invested in to put in place those mechanisms that allow them to capture routinely import the data that is pertinent to for reuse and and, and and i'm afraid as as you get closer as the organizations get smaller and more numerous it, it um the, the challenge gets bigger uh, for both for them and, and for um those that attempt to use that data so i think there's a lot of work that needs to be done um uh, and the, but there is, I'm, from our experience, a great deal of excitement and appetite for doing it because I think it's not just uh, very important people sitting very high up the pyramid that understand that data is the answer to many of the current problems, the sequelae of, of COVID notwithstanding it, everything. It could be uh, better understood with data and, and that applies at a local level as well as a national level. So I think there's a there's a real imperative here to try and cascade this um, both the investment and but also the um, uh, the expertise and the skill and support right the way down to those ultimately the practitioners on the ground. Absolutely, and and the audience might be interested in uh, another project that fits within the ADR England. Uh, investment. It's called Local Data Spaces. And if you put that into the search uh, on the ADI UK website, you'll find out all about it. But it's essentially um, supporting uh, researchers within local authorities make sense of the wealth of data that's been amassed around the COVID pandemic and not just about health of the population but also about you know local economic situations and if you do check it out and come back to us with any questions if you have any. Um, if I move on to the next question um, which is having a specialist understanding of a data source uh, so how the data were obtained and who is in, who is not, etc., is important when analysing and interpreting results. How can we help researchers bring this understanding in, especially when using linked administrative data from multiple sources? Um, 
Chris, do you want to take that question? Yeah, so I mean, a, a, a really good uh, point. I, and I think I've always been um, sort of caught in a bit of a, a, a trap thinking about this uh, in the sense that uh, I, I think sometimes there's an innate caution about making data available that comes from complex and disparate sources. Uh, there's a fear that, um, you know, misinterpretation of the data uh, can result. However, I, I, I think actually um, the, that's the way to, uh, particularly where data is linked together, you can sometimes get a much better understanding of the the the, the the various biases um, that, that can e exist it, it, in the, the data. So I think my feeling, which is maybe hinted at by the questioner, is that the best way to develop this is to have active projects, but they're making sure that these projects aren't sort of isolated, independent, but feedback in a positive way into informational flows. I think most of the systems now across the UK uh, inevitably will have a set of research advisors. So what we need to make sure is that the, the projects using this data, particularly when it's the first time, feed that learning uh, back into those advisors. But probably that's not sufficient on its own, that we need uh, an active community of users out there, that certainly until these data become more research ready in the sense that they're uh, well understood and highly prepared, then that community can act uh, together to advise uh, and help researchers that are coming new to that data. So I think, Emma, that's probably a challenge to us to make sure that those kind of forums exist. But I, I suspect it's something that ADR UK, uh, I know, is um, sort of aware of and thinking about. Thanks very much. And uh, if I take another question for the audience, which is an interesting one, uh, reflecting on uh, Hetton's talk, had public appetite for data use now changed or were we just automated in the first place? Um, I don't know who wants to take this question first. Yeah. I'm sure you've all got something to say on it. <laughs> shall I? Shall I start? I'm not sure if that. I'm not sure the etiquette is. Yeah. David, okay, you I'll, I'll, I'll start just by saying that, that uh, as we've been we've been linking a lot of data for a long time, as you might imagine, and we didn't do that without cons you know having really quite detailed and multiple mechanisms of consulting with the public uh, uh, um, throughout everything that the sale data bank does and indeed ADR does uh, and um, so that has enabled us longitudinally to sort of have a bit of a, a, a litmus test or a, a thermometer or public opinion as, as time has gone on and I, and I don't really think that uh, in my experience that COVID has done anything to change what was in the past and remains uh, uh, a, a very solid enthusiasm and support for, for data linkage when, as the ADR slide that we, we were shown earlier, I think by Alex, um, when it's done properly uh, and safely and securely and uh, with all the protections in place. I think the argument is uh, easy, easy, easy to win. In fact, there is no argument with the public when you explain when you how to do things properly, you're going to do things properly and responsibly. Um, and um, I think where the change has come is not in the public. I think it's it's it is in those data owners that may have been nervous in the past. They have seen that actually sharing data um, uh, is a good. It can happen, and it has a, a manifest important um, outcome. And COVID has given us that example. And and I think the public will go with it as long as we have do what we've always done, which is although we've done things a lot faster uh, through COVID because of the, the kind of epidemic imperative, we haven't done things less thoroughly. Uh, and our, every single one, for example, every single one of our process steps that we would normally go through to make sure it's all done properly, remained intact during COVID, although the time we took to do them was massively accelerated. Um, so I, I, I think the public are there at our side, as long as we are clear with them that we're doing things right. Yeah, Emma, I was going to comment on that if I, could, if I can quickly. Um, just one observation, I think, is that um, the the kind of risk appetite is probably asymmetrical. So that, that you know, there's hundreds of good projects that have gone well, and all it takes is one that doesn't go well to kind of offset the balance. And I think the real challenge is highlighting what's gone well and how often it goes well, um, because there'll, there'll be a tension on where it doesn't go well. I think that's one of the challenges for data controllers, data owners. But also those working with data. I think it's actually very hard to understand until you see summary slides like the ones you put up about how much of this work is going on 
um, and how little otherwise you hear about things going wrong with it. Um, so that, I think that's one thing to consider. And actually, that might also feed into the public debate. And that's a fantastic note to end uh, the our session, first session of the conference on. And thanks very much to all the uh, panel members for that. Uh, we gone one minute over but uh if you keep your connection open we'll just have a 15 minute break before we come back uh and roger halliday from adr scotland will be chairing the next session thank you very much <laughs>